Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets, how to increase your market business success, and in our current climate, maximize safety while providing people with fresh food. Farmer's markets are essential. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer or food maker selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. Our guest this week is Kendall Ballantyne, farmer and owner of Central Park Farms, about how she grew her farm-to-table business through the power of digital marketing. Hi, everyone. I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I'm a longtime farmer's market manager, Vendor 101 co-teacher, and education coordinator at Farmer's Market Pros. And I'm Cat Fields-White, director of San Diego Markets, still an active farmer's market manager, founder of Farmer's Market Pros, and host of Intense, the Farmer's Market Conference, and the Farmer's Market Pros community. And I'm Justine marzoni Mead, Tent Talk producer and marketing director for Farmer's Market Pros. Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast, is supported by Vendor 101, creating successful farmer's market farmers and vendors and streamlining the application process for market managers. This self-paced online class helps identify qualified vendors and teaches them to present their products and use effective marketing display and customer service skills. Working with market managers, educated vendors create thriving farmer's markets. Find more information at vendor-101.com or by clicking their logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk. Today, we're speaking with Kendall Ballantyne, farmer at Central Park Farms and farm marketing expert. In 2019, Kendall won the Farmer's Market Vendor of the Year Award from the BC Association of Farmer's Markets in British Columbia, Canada. In 2020, in the middle of a global pandemic, Kendall launched Marketing for Farmers to help give farmers the tools to grow their farmer's market and agricultural business online. Welcome, Kendall. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Farmers markets are so near and dear to my heart. It was the number one driver of business for my farm. So when I had an opportunity to come and talk to you, I was so excited. We are really excited to yeah. talk to you. We love hearing that, of course. <laughs> yeah, and we've been um, fangirling for a while about, we always talk about how funny you are on Instagram and are laughing at, you know, all the things that you post there. So I, I so appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> Intense <laughs> conference goals. Yes. yes. Kendall in San Diego. Yeah. If the I, I would love to. Yes. I would love to. I uh, just got back from a workshop in o- Oklahoma teaching farmers um, how to grow their businesses online. And I would love an opportunity to speak with you guys at your conference. It's always right. a yeah. goal of mine to just help my fellow farmers market vendors. I well, we're thinking it. about those uh, March 2022 dates and, you know, yes. you got crossing it. our fingers that maybe we could get her here and back without a quarantine by then. <laughs> <laughs> Here's hoping. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as a Canadian, it was a struggle to just travel, but I'm here. I'm currently in 14 day quarantine. Perfect time to talk to you all. Um, <laughs> I've got a nice quiet home because no one can be around me right now. But um, yeah, makes a perfect, perfect podcast time. That's what we're going to do from now on for booking. We're just going to look for people in quarantine. Yes. We, we know they're available. Let's start if we see them traveling, we're going to say, all oh. right, we're a couple weeks out and then we can get them a nice quiet spot. There perfect time to chat. Uh, well, Kendall, why don't you tell us and our listeners, um, like, what's your professional background and how did you get into agriculture? So I was not a farmer. I became a <laughs> farmer accidentally. So I was the director of operations for a multinational transportation provider that specialized in grocery transportation throughout North America. So I was literally the local food movement's worst nightmare. I shipped for <laughs> big box retailers, the biggest that you have that we have in North America, and I shipped grocery products. And then at 27, I fell in love with a farmer. I mean, Aww, at 27, so, so many of our decisions in life revolves around falling in love with somebody. <laughs> so uh, I fell in love with my husband, Jay, my now husband, Jay. Um, he was a retired farmer. He had been a commercial farmer for many, many years and then decided to take a different uh, life avenue and had gotten out of agriculture. I have always been somebody who loves a good challenge. And when we first got together, he started telling me all about agriculture. And I started realizing that things that I maybe thought through marketing was a certain way. Um, I produce meat. So when it came to how meat is marketed by, you know, large middlemen and large grocery chains, I realized that I was spending money thinking I was supporting a certain type of agriculture that maybe aligned with my values 
only to find out from Jay that maybe there was some greenwashing in that messaging. And he knew because he actually knew the farmers that were growing it and producing it. So the things I was, you know, investing my hard earned money in was no longer aligning with what I thought I was supporting. So I convinced Jay through a lot of no's. He said no for a long time. Um, I convinced him to let me set, um, set myself up to raise some chicken just for ourselves And Jay said, you can do it as long as you offset your costs. So I was working full-time corporate, crazy long hours. And Jay was like, sure, you, you eventually he said, sure, you can do it, but you need to offset your costs. And so I went to work, I came home and he was like, I set you up with chicks. I opened up the barn and there was 500 chicks there. (laughs) Whoa. And (laughs) go big or go home. He was like, I just set you up with some chicks. He admits now that he did it thinking that I would do just like not enjoy it at all. (laughs) And I'd struggle to sell them. And then we'd be eating those like same 500 frostbitten chickens for the next 10 years. And it would just be the end of it. And he could go back to not farming. (laughs) But I had a really strong social media background from previous work that I had done. So the day I got home, I launched an Instagram page and a Facebook page. I named our farm. It was really not supposed to be a farm, but it was just, I, you know, I put a name on it. I did some little light branding. And by by the time those eight weeks passed, we had sold about 75% of the birds pre-sold because I was just hustling. I mean, a lot was for friends and family and they probably thought I was going through some crazy quarter life crisis that I had decided (laughs) to start a farm. Um, But they ended up supporting me and it just kind of snowballed from there and, and I loved it. And then I started getting phone calls from people saying, Hey, I had your chicken at my friend's house at a barbecue and it was delicious. Do you mind selling some to me? And it just kind of went out of control from there. We got pigs and then I got cattle and pretty soon I was at farmer's markets and it was a full business and I left my corporate career. See, chicks, baby chicks are a gateway drug. They're a yeah. gateway. Right? <laughs> yeah. they oh, are. my neighbor has ch- has chickens, so hopefully they don't end up with livestock. <laughs> yeah. Like a cow in your neighbor's yeah. yard. Yeah, that's right. Like, <laughs> the pigs will be there next week. They're so cute. <laughs> but for some people, 500 chicks would be overwhelming. So I can see where maybe your husband was trying to see, okay, are you going to be serious about this? Yeah. Are you going to yeah. love it? trying to it? scare you straight. Yeah, so you're going to be <laughs> scared by this. And if you're not scared by 500 chicks, then it's probably going to be the life for you. So, so have you dragged and it, him and it out was. of retirement? It's, he's he's also farming now, right? Yeah. He is. Yeah. He is. So I did a hundred percent of the farming for the first few years. He did the teaching me to farm and I did the farming. And at the beginning, it's funny because for so long, he's like, Kendall, I cannot teach you how to farm with a cell phone in your hand. <laughs> I'd be like, well, I can't sell it without a cell phone in my hand. So we're going to have to, you know, come to a, an agreement here. And now he's the first one to yell, Kendall, grab your phone and animals are doing something cute. <laughs> and so he now totally understands that our business is driven by the fact that we're online and that we've opened up our lives to an online community. And now he's the first one to holler at me to grab a phone. I mean, he's still using an iPhone five, so he's not on social media. Um, He's definitely like an old school farmer when it comes to social media, but he understands the value in it for us. And so he's quick to holler at one of our teenagers or me and, and, get your phone. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Got to know the value of that. That's right. That's right. I'm seeing a lot more old school farmers, though, that are getting as their spouses or their very often their children are dragging them into it, finding that, oh, yeah, okay, this newfangled Instaweb <laughs> thing <laughs> can really move a lot of produce. For sure. For sure. For sure. For sure. And it's so pretty to take pictures of cute animals and farm life and all of that. So it's a great, you have great material already. We do. Um, so you, so you all are growing a variety of meat. It sounds like. Um, and when did you start selling at farmers markets? When did you make that? So, leap? so I made that leap because for the at the beginning when I was working my corporate job, still I'd have to call Jay from my office and be like, "I, you need to meet Susie in the driveway at ten thirty <laughs> because she's coming to pick up three chickens." And he was self employed, and eventually he's like. I cannot keep waiting in the driveway (laughs) with chickens under my arm for like this, like sketchy chicken cash deal in our driveway. And he was like, I can't do that anymore. He's like, you need to make a decision. You're either going to be a corporate businesswoman or you're going to be a farmer. And so I chose being a farmer. But then all of a sudden I was like, I'm not going to be able to sell enough selling out of my driveway. So we immediately started looking at farmer's markets. 
And when I say I was unexperienced in farmer's markets, I had never shopped at a farmer's market before I started selling at a farmer's market. Oh, wow. Wow. Tisk tisk. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, when I say, because when you think about it, all of my customers were large grocery chains. Yeah. Yeah. So I supported the businesses that paid my wages. Sure. So I shopped at the big box stores because that's who I dealt with on a daily basis. So farmers markets weren't on my radar. Agriculture wasn't on my radar, but suddenly I was getting thrown into this situation where I was promoting local food and then still going back to my corporate job and shipping meat for the big players all over North America. And I was like, I got to make a decision here. I either need to be pro local food or I need to be supporting what I'm doing in my daily career. So when Jay was like, I can't keep meeting Susie in the driveway, (laughs) it was a really easy adjustment for me to make that decision. So we launched into farmer's markets really quickly. I lucked out in that my mom was looking at retiring. She was also in the same corporate industry as me, but for a different company. And she was getting ready to retire. I was getting ready to try to kick this business into being something. And so when my mom was ready to retire, I was like, do you want to just come and work at farmer's markets with me? And can we do this thing together? And she absolutely jumped at the opportunity to be able to hang out with her. Like, oh, I'm an only child, her only kid and get to (laughs) do farmer's markets together. And I jumped at the opportunity because setting up a meat booth, like we set up in a 10 by 10 booth. That's, that's a beast to set up. We have a lot of products and it's a big undertaking and we move a lot of products. So I got my mom on board and my mom is a farmer's market queen. She's so good. She's just that woman that you want to talk to at the market and we get to do it together, which has been such a, a blessing for our family, getting to spend time with my mom every weekend. And so customers fun. love that family mm-hmm. businesses. Yeah. I'm sure they get a kick out of just seeing the two of you interact. They do. They love it. And especially because my target market is of the age where I could be their kid. And so a lot of times when I, when my demographic is more my mom's age, they look at it as like, oh, I'd love to be able to do that with my daughter. Or, you know, I love the fact that you have this great relationship that you can work together. Mom always says she works for me. I always say she works with me. Mom's (laughs) proud of the fact that I am a business owner that, and it's turned out and worked out. I'm proud of the fact that I get to partner with my mom and work with her, but depending on who you ask. It's a different arrangement. <laughs> and there's that hidden message. Mm-hmm. Buy is. this steak and you'll end up spending more time with your child. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, right? Be like me. Or your mom. Hey, it's you a know. gateway. <laughs> <laughs> One more gateway. So which farmer's markets did you start in there in Canada? And um, like how long were you in the farmer's market scene? So we have been in farmer's markets for six years. We started out with the smaller markets um, as an untested vendor in a space where there were very established vendors. It was really hard for us to break into new markets where there was longstanding vendors had been there in meat production for 15, 20 years at the same markets. And all of a sudden you've got this 27 year old first gen that's trying to get into the, you know, I can produce all the things and sell all the things. And all the the bigger markets were like, not in our market. You can't, you're going to have to go to the little markets, which was fine. Cause I mean, looking back, it was my training wheels. So I got into the smaller markets. Um, at the time we did four a week Four a week on top of doing all of the farming was an incredible undertaking for us. It was a lot. It was a lot, Um, but we loved it. And we had the opportunity to kind of bounce around and figure out which markets were best for us. We had some markets that were really incredible and we had some markets that the sales just weren't what we needed them to be for whatever reason. Typically it was when we were in a community that was too close to farmland where, you know, you went to church with somebody who produced the same stuff as me and you probably weren't buying my products because you know somebody. Um, But it helped us figure out get our name recognition into a bunch of communities and also be able to figure out what markets work best for us and our product so that we could really moving forward, get to a point that we went down to two farmers markets. We got into two really big farmers markets and we were able to sell a lot more product because we had name recognition by that point and do significantly less markets. How far did you have to go to get to the bigger markets? Because I think this is something that comes up a lot with farmers. They're like, ah, farmers markets, you have to travel so far to get there. But the reason is what you just said, that if you stay close to home, a lot of times you're near other farms who are either producing their own stuff or trading with their neighbors or, you know, it's easy for them to access it. The buyers don't tend to be near where you farm. 
A hundred percent. So I'm lucky in that my farm is only 45 minutes outside of Vancouver, but my ranch is four and a half hours outside of Vancouver. So even if I wasn't living here close to Vancouver and I was at my ranch, I would certainly be driving to Vancouver to sell at that market because in my community where my ranch is, no one is paying the rates that I need to charge to make a sustainable business. Like when everyone raises cattle in my neighborhood, they are shocked at the price that I charge per pound of ground, but in Vancouver and in the communities where you're not closely, when your neighbor's not raising cattle, the prices are higher. And it's the only way that I can sustain a business financially. And as a farmer, I got to be financially sustainable. Otherwise I'm not around to be able to supply the community. So for me driving the distance, I would drive four and a half, five hours for a farmer's market if it was successful any day of the week. That's just part of my sales channel. And we had really, we had really benefited from the fact that we launched an online store and used our farmer's market locations as a pickup location for for our market. So it allowed us to no longer just focus on the customers of that farmer's market and we could expand out and focus on the city or the neighboring cities. And then it was, if you wanted to buy my product, you didn't have to just be a Vancouver farmer's market shopper. You could be in Vancouver, Richmond, Burnaby, and we could pull people and make that a pickup location. And how for wonderful for your, I mean, how great for the farmer's market, because yeah, then you're is. pulling in this much wider swath of customers than just their local neighborhood. And obviously, when they come to pick up the meat, they're probably going to grab some veggies and you know, pick up some fruit. <laughs> of course. Jam. We would see customers showing up that you knew that wasn't their home market. And I knew that based on the fact that I get their addresses. Like, I know that's not their neighborhood market. I know how many markets they drove past to get to us. And you'd see them and they'd do the wave by when they walked in, they'd go get other produce and fresh cut flowers and artisan products. And then they'd come grab their order. So it gave me a good opportunity to be able to go into some of those bigger markets. But even when we were in the small markets, we did that. So it was to the point that I was in some markets that unfortunately didn't end up being very successful from a standpoint of other vendor sales. But it didn't matter because my sales were high anyways, because what I needed was a a piece of concrete in a parking lot. Yeah. Right. For sure. So it turns out that 27-year-old first-gen farmer wasn't such a bad bet after all for those markets. (laughs) No. and, And honestly, it's the reason I got into the big markets, even though there wasn't necessarily space for me. Because I hustled all those other markets and I put myself in a position that every vendor at the market was getting advertised by me. Like that morning I was being Instagram stories and I'd be promoting the coffee vendor and the baked goods vendor and the produce vendor, because it's a lot easier for me to convince somebody to get out of bed on a Sunday morning to come get a frozen chicken. If they also know they can get a delicious pastry (laughs) and they can get a hot cup of coffee and strawberries are in season. So I stopped treating the market as a means for them to advertise me. And I started realizing that I needed to advertise them. And then all the other market managers were like, dang, we want that girl at our market because she's promoting the market Mm -hmm. instead of relying on us to promote her. So it made it so that I could get into those markets that really like double, triple, quadrupled our revenue in the same amount of time. Yeah, And that's so smart too. Um, I think one of the pain points of specifically ranchers at the farmer's market is like, it's kind of hard to like take pretty pictures of meat. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) And like, especially like digitally, like you you know, there's a reason why, like, our rancher or our Dolly Ranch, like, posts a lot of photos of, like, animals. Just because, like, the meat itself isn't as attractive. So yeah. it's smart to be like, hey, get, you know, get your muffin, get your hot cup of coffee, pick up some pretty veggies, and pick up your order. You know, kind of playing on the strengths of the other vendors around you. Mm-hmm my booth is never going to be as beautiful as a bounty of produce. Like I don't, yeah. <laughs> it's just not possible. Meat and butcher paper or cryovac frozen pork chop is, ju- I mean, I love and I'm proud of my products, but it is never going to be a beautiful photo. So the fact that I can go and take photos of the other vendors in their area of expertise in what they're creating, not only am I promoting them, but when I tag them into my Instagram stories, they're more likely to reshare because I've created content on their behalf and And I'm now exposed to their customer base, which we sell at the same market. Oftentimes, customers of the market are following them as well. And now I've exposed my business to their customers where maybe they hadn't heard of me yet. So it's kind of a a double-edged sword where we can really promote the market and the other vendors. And in turn, I get extra promotion through all of those people that I'm hustling for in the beginning of my market date. 
I want to take sure. that little clip there and just show it on <laughs> continuous loop in the market for a couple of weeks and then remind our vendors of what just, yeah. works. What's, Text all our vendors yeah. with that recording. Let's put it on the Jumbotron. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. The, the cross-marketing at farmer's markets is just, like, endless. I mean, it's just... People could cross market into oblivion there. I mean, I don't. Sometimes I just don't understand why vent, more vendors don't do that kind of thing because it's just so readily available. Yeah. And you're right about the followers. A market vendors' followers are people who want to follow market vendors. <laughs> so why wouldn't <laughs> right you there. get together with that and try to share that? You know, for the benefit of everybody. So it sounds like you had that really dialed in. And which leads me to my next uh, kind of question, which may have something to do with that. Uh, we heard you were uh, voted Farmer's Market Vendor of the Year, which is very exciting. And we don't have <laughs> anything like that at our market, so now I'm going to start it. It sounds like sort of a weird spiral, though. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. like, how many people are hostile that somebody else was Farmer's you know Market what? Vendor of the That's Year? That's the breaks. Got to work harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the BC Association of Farmer's Markets, which represents all of um, the markets in BC that are food based and farmer based. So they have certain criteria to become members of the BCAFM. So when the BCAFM does their awards, they do market manager of the year, they do vendor of the year, um, they do volunteer of the year, which is fantastic because we know that volunteers are the lifeblood of markets in a lot of cases. And also market of the year, whether it's small, medium or large, they have a bunch of different categories and they award it based on the province and how um, different you know, categories are doing in the province. And so I was really lucky. I was nominated very early on in um, my market time. I did not win that year. Um, but then I ended up being nominated again um, just in 2019. And that time I ended up taking the category and won um, Farmer's Market Vendor of the Year. And honestly, I, I think it is because I, I really go above and beyond to hustle my markets. I sat on boards of markets. I consulted for markets. If there was an event that was raising money, I was, you know, giving even e either my time or a donation, making sure I was really promoting the other vendors and trying my best to, to go above and beyond in supporting the markets. Because a lot of times our markets are volunteer run or they're run by a manager who gets enough hours to run the market, but doesn't necessarily have a background in marketing or the time to do marketing. So it was always my standpoint that I'm getting a really inexpensive piece of real estate to, to run a business. And a lot of times these are nonprofit organizations. So the fact that I could be given such an, an awesome opportunity to be able to sell at farmer's markets and run a little farm booth for under a hundred bucks and I could do it every week. I was, can I write a blog post for you? Can I, what can I do to help? Because I'm getting so much value out of this nonprofit organization, allowing me the opportunity to sell my goods in this way. So whatever I could do to help the markets um, was something that I was willing to do as a business owner because it just makes good business sense. I'd vote for her. <laughs> yeah. She's been Have our vote. I endorse right? this message. Yeah, I endorse this Farmer's Market Vendor of the Year at, um, award. Yeah. yeah are, I, you, are you running again in 2021? Yeah, right. yeah. I yeah. want to win that Farmer's Market Manager Award. That sounds... Sounds fun. It does like sound I want to, I want to see what the criteria is for that. Okay. Well, obviously, in this particular case, it's you've got to be in British Columbia. Well, here I come. <laughs> so you all should that, launch that stuff. in your state because yes. it's, it's an awesome award, and it just gives some people recognition for all the hard work that they're doing, and it allows us an opportunity to learn about the stories of other markets that are outside of our area, and learn about some of the cool initiatives that different market managers are taking on. It's just it's a really cool award to be able to see even who's nominated. Yeah. 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 Really fun. I know they do have uh, California Alliance for Fa Family Farmers. When they do their conference every year, they do do a farmers market champion. Oh, so yes. they have that one that's, that's in the farmers also market category. Yeah. <laughs> so since you're clearly a vendor of the year, vendor of the day, uh, the vendor everybody would want. And it sounds Dream like vendor. it was successful for you. <laughs> Why are you transitioning out of farmers markets for now? Yeah, so I am. I'm actually officially done farmer's markets. And unfortunately, it's not really by choice. Um, we ran into to some really big hurdles in meat processing in our province. Um, it's something that not just I deal with. And about a year ago, I got notice from our butchers that unfortunately, they were taking a transition away from doing custom for other farms. And they were just going to focus internally because they were growing at a very uh, fast pace as a business. And we had grown at a very fast pace as a business. So eventually it just got to the point where 
they couldn't take on other farms any longer and they wanted to focus internally on their business, which I'm a business person first. I get that. Um, So at the time we started, thankfully they gave me a year's notice and I started to look at who can handle our account. Where can we go? Who can handle our account? And the problem is, is that we are in this weird, we're too big for most people that would take on custom, but we're not necessarily big enough that we wanted to open our own shop. So we were in this weird kind of limbo for about a year. We were, we were trying. And then we got to about the six month mark. And I was like, forget it. I'm opening a butcher shop. (laughs) We're doing it. We're doing the thing. We're going to spend the, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that it takes to open a butcher shop. And we started that process. We were going to put a butcher shop on our farm and then COVID hit. And suddenly the health authorities did not care that Central Park Farms wanted to open a butcher shop. Fair enough. There was other priorities in the world, but I was stuck in this little limbo like, hey, but hand up, remember me? (laughs) I need a butcher shop and I need it in like six months. Otherwise we don't have a business anymore. And it just didn't, we ended up so busy when the pandemic hit all of a sudden as a meat producer. I mean, I'm sure you guys realize we were just slammed and we had farmers markets close and I had friends that had lost their sales channel. So suddenly instead of just operating an online store for myself, I was like, bring your stuff. We'll put it online. And suddenly we were an online grocery store for any products. So chocolate bar, you know, our, our artisan chocolate vendor at the market and our garlic vendor and our friend that raised, you know, water Buffalo, all of a sudden everything was online for us because our friends were in a position where they just couldn't move as much product as they were moving when they had access to the farmer's markets. And I can't be a champion for agriculture if I'm not willing to help out. So suddenly We were processing so many online orders. Thankfully, my kids were pulled out of school. My teenagers were picking orders from the moment we woke up until the moment we went to bed. We were, I mean, it was insane. I had tenants on our farm that were suddenly packing orders with us. It was, it was nuts to keep up. And suddenly it was like, I got burnt out and I had a moment where I was like, could I handle this and a butcher shop? No, I I couldn't farm at the capacity that I was at and handle a butcher shop. And I wasn't super confident in the regulations that we were running into as far as being able to continue to process our animals. Um, In BC, you have, if you're doing on-farm butchery, you have to produce 51% of the animals on farm. And I was worried that we were going to COVID hit and all of a sudden we were running out of our abattoirs. We're no longer taking small farms. I was like, I could put this butcher shop in and I could, by no fault of my own, not be able to hit that 51%. And then I wouldn't be able to process for anyone. And I would be sitting with an empty building. And it was just financially, that wasn't a risk I was willing to take. I was getting real tired. So in October uh, October 26th of last year, we announced we were closing our business. At the height, like our sales were through the roof. And we had we felt like we were left with no choice. We were losing our butcher. I, I wasn't in a position to open that shop any longer. Um, so we announced closure and started selling off livestock and started doing all the thing. And it became, as a 27-year-old, when I started my farm in first generation, the government loves to make me a poster child. I become a poster child. Whether I want to or not, I'm, I'm the go-to because I put my life online in social media. Media comes to me when it's time to tell a story. And this had been a story that had been going on for a long time about losing farmers weren't having access to the resources they needed in our province. And suddenly there was like a name that they could put, they could say this, this woman is losing her business and this woman's closing her farm and we're losing this asset to the community. So suddenly I was in the newspaper, even though I wasn't actually making a statement, I refused to make a statement at that point because I was just really tired. So I was like, I've made my decision. I'll come and advocate for agriculture after I have a nap because I'm tired. (laughs) And I just, I was like, when I'll be unstoppable lobbying once this is over, but I didn't feel like there was a chance we were going to be able to save our business. So I wanted to just give myself a little bit of rest, but we still ended up in the newspaper for it. It still ended up being a thing. And our butchers called us and they were like, we can't be responsible for you closing. So let's figure it out. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness, we couldn't have figured this out six months ago. <laughs> right? Like, oh, right. Oh my God. Oh my God. But oh God. I think it just took that, like it actually coming to an end and it being obvious that we had exhausted every opportunity. And our butchers have always been incredible. This was never a decision against us as a business. It was just a decision that they felt they needed to make. 
And so now um, we're one of the, I think we might be the only custom customer that they kept on. Um, so we needed to reduce though, like out of a, an appreciation for the fact that they were going to, I can't grow at the same rate that I was. I can't keep pushing the limits with them on, on what they're willing to do. So the only way that I could scale back was to stop doing farmer's markets. Uh, so how are you selling now? So now we sell exclusively online. Um, so we do hundred percent online with either farm gate pickup or we do home delivery within an hour and a half radius of our farm. Uh, mm-hmm. Gotcha. So it's, it's definitely, we've only been doing this for three weeks or four weeks. We've oh. been out of the markets at this point. So we're fresh. Like yeah. I still have the like uncomfortable gut on Saturday that I'm not at the market. <laughs> I still have that like, Ugh, I'm watching the market exist without me. And oh. I love the market and I haven't quite, like I haven't done a shop at the market yet. Cause I still feel like it's like a little, too, I love markets. So it's like a little too soon for me. I'm just kind of letting things settle. Um, but we definitely are still having that little bit of a, it's a big revenue shift for sure. us. Yeah. Like, yeah. So how does that affecting your I mean, how, so how, what does it do to revenue? Are you now a smaller oh, ranch business? We so we are currently still inboarding the same amount of product as we were because I mean that's the thing with yeah. producing animals. There's animals on the ground, right. so it, I, they don't stop growing just because I'm not at market. So <laughs> we are bringing in still as much product and crossing our fingers that we have built enough of a relationship with our with our tried and true customers, and so far they are showing up for us. Obviously, we're going to lose some of that just like passing by traffic, which is fair enough. Um, So we're in that process right now where we're just kind of figuring out where we settle in without markets. And then we'll start pushing again for social media and really trying to pull in new customers. Because that was the thing. We were doing so well at farmer's markets and we were producing at our maximum capacity. We couldn't handle any new customers. So instead of doing a social media push to gain customers, I was doing a maintenance, like let's just maintain. Cause I didn't want to be in a situation where we were sold out of everything all the time and that the demand, and then all of a sudden our customers who have been tried and true and with us from the beginning are feeling like, you know, she got too big for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the whole social media thing this last year has been a really counterintuitive process because our goal in the past was always let's get as many people as we possibly can to the market. And now we're not allowed to have over a certain number of people at the market. So we want to still keep yes. talking about the market. So our farmers and vendors sell, but we don't want to encourage people to come. We just, we just <laughs> want them to buy things without showing up. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah, it's, and it's I weird. Mean, and it so I guess weird. it's going to take you a while to figure out financially if the cost of delivery and things, how that compares to renting your space at the farmer's market and how the whole net winds up, right? You're not quite there yet. For sure. I mean, we had the benefit of the fact that we always had an online store sure. and we always did to a certain degree delivery. Oh, okay. um, we just weren't doing it nearly as much as we are now. So we, we lowered our price way down on our delivery because I was able to do the math of like, now I'm not doing stall fees. We were still driving out. Now we're taking care of our own delivery because we're not at a farmer's market a couple of days a week with multiple team members. Like my husband's out doing deliveries right now. So we were able to do the math on that quite easily. So now it's just a matter of, we need to get more customers. And I've confidently, I mean, I've, I've been able to prove that I can do that through marketing online. So now I just need to shift my, my marketing message again, and I'm confident I can do it. So I'm just letting things settle. I'm letting my husband get used to doing the deliveries so that we don't all of a sudden, like we, you know, grew and he can't keep up. I want him to settle into that. And then we'll start pushing again. We well, just, I guess I don't with your history, to... you could set up a whole logistic system for people delivering <laughs> farm goods, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Draw back on that old experience. Yeah. But instead, it sounds to me like you're going to focus, ha, use a little time that you're not spending at the farmer's markets to uh, focus on your online business, on teaching other people to do well online. We, we are. And I mean, I do like my mom and my aunt, because now my aunt works for me too. So my aunt's also in the, in the family mix. Um, she moved from Alberta to BC and she goes to the markets too. And I mean, both of them have been like, are you sure you don't just want to do like one smaller market just, you know, so that we still have something to do <laughs> because they just like, they like the getting out of the house, especially right now. Like we're still under all these quarantine restrictions in Canada. So it's, you get to go to a farmer's market. And so my mom and aunt are like, maybe just one through the summer, one close <laughs> that we can go to so that we get some socializing still and uh, get to interact with people because you just can't beat that. 
Like well, so farmers we'll stay market. tuned. We'll stay yeah. tuned and see if mom yeah. convinces Kendall yeah. because this is, a, this is a developing story. What kind That's of right. pressure are mom and aunt going to put on you? That's right. <laughs> I know. And I've got a teenager who's 16 now and she's got her L and she's getting market. close to getting Staff. her like, you know, end license. And pretty soon, who knows, maybe she'll be hooking up to a trailer <laughs> and going to market. So right now we're not doing markets. You never know. I, I've learned in this business to never, you know, say for sure because I yeah. thought I had said for sure that we were closing <laughs> and like we were selling stuff, and all of a sudden it was like, nope, never mind, we're open. Great. <laughs> Forget that last that pig. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've seen a lot of our our farmers market vendors, you know, having the online sale channel is really valuable, especially in times of a global pandemic, you know, or even just like family emergencies or just when something happens at the markets, it's good to have another way that people can find you or you have people that can no longer come to your market and they want to continue to support you. And so having those online channels are super valuable in tandem with market. So um, could you just, I know that you do a lot of consulting, but you're on our podcast. So I was hoping you could um, just give us like top three tips or kind of these, the biggest pieces of advice you think that could help farmers or farmers market vendors getting into online sales. Like what are the three things that they need? I'm so glad you asked this because I definitely have, I've got a top three, I've got a top 10, I've got all of them. <laughs> um, but if I was narrowing it down to my top three, number one would be showing up online. We need to see your face. We need to connect with you. That's what people love about shopping at farmer's markets. You need to create that same connection online that you do when you're face-to-face -face in person at a farmer's market. Because we've even seen, even if you're a farmer's market only vendor and you're not selling through an e-commerce store, we're now masked at our farmer's markets. We're shop don't stop at the farmer's market in Canada. You're, we're not getting that same connection. I can't run up and give one of my customers a hug and, you know, thank them for coming out. And, you know, I can't see the big smiles on my customers' faces anymore and they can't see mine. So being able to have them connect with me online so that when they see me in person, they still feel like they're getting that connection is so important. We have to be showing up with our faces online. It, your products might be the most beautiful products in the world. We still need to be promoting that no like, and trust factor for our customers, especially in agriculture. There are a million people working against us in documentaries and everything else, especially for us meat producers. So we need to make sure that our customers are getting a deep connection and that they realize they can no like, and trust us. Otherwise they might as well shop with a big box retailer. It's a lot more convenient. Yeah. Absolutely. Also, the algorithm um, prefers like showing human faces. So like mm -hmm. if you put your face on Instagram, it's going to get a lot more engagement than just a, a photo of your product or a photo of the market. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly. Um, my number two tip would be to see if you can add an e-commerce option to your model, even if you're just selling at farmer's markets. Having that ability to have guaranteed income because I have guaranteed income before I even go to the farmer's market. I know I have X amount of sales, which is such a confidence builder, especially when all of a sudden it's sleeting and raining and, you know, <laughs> I'm in Canada. So it snows at our markets, knowing that I have already have those people's orders and their money really helps. We're at a hundred and something products these days. We've got an extensive list. It is almost impossible for me to bring enough of all the different things. And one week might be a chicken week and one might be a pork chop week. And we don't always know those trends. So being able to have customers pre-order means we're going to run out. We're going to sell out a lot less likely of certain products and customers can skate in at the final minute, which has been so helpful during COVID because as you know, we're limited on the number of people we can have inside the market zone. So there are times where my customers will call us and we'll run their order outside of the market zone so that if they're only coming for our products, it stops that extra body in the market zone when you can then let somebody else in that can shop with a different vendor. It also gives me the opportunity to farm fresh eggs. We sell eggs. Everybody wants to show up at the beginning of the market before our eggs sell out. I don't want the market to be inundated during COVID with a huge lineup. I would rather be able to divide that out throughout the day. So then we have customers that are willing to show up in the final hour of the market when typically it's slower 
because they know they're getting the product that they want and they're not worried that I've sold out in the first hour. So it helps us take that big mass of customers that come for our products and divide it more evenly throughout the market day, which is easier for market organizers. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's been huge for us. Yeah. Better for everybody. That's something that Pat always talks about too, is like the farmer's market, our competition is grocery stores and people can show up at the, the moment a grocery store opens in the morning or the last person at night, and typically the same stuff is on the shelf throughout the day. Mm. And if you're shopping at the market and you show up at 145 when the market closes at 2 and everything's sold out, you're going to just be like, oh, well, crap, now I have to go to the grocery store. Yeah, because that's not how you make up. regular shop- yeah. shoppers, farmer's market yes. shoppers. Yeah. And it pains me when I know I have this massive walk-in freezers at home and I have the product in my freezer and somebody comes and they want it. And I'm like, oh, if I had just planned differently, but how, like, I'd love to pretend that I know exactly what people are going to want to buy. And sure there's trends, but I'm a meat producer. So my product's frozen in the freezer. I have more of it. It's not like produce where, you know, you can harvest what you can harvest. I have the ability to have more. And so it makes it so much easier for me to be able to pre-plan that. Um, for sure. And then finally, it's starting an email marketing list, starting an email newsletter. We are dealing with so many algorithm issues on social media these days, especially for meat producers. We're starting to see farmers getting their accounts shut down because it doesn't fall in line with community standards. Um, We can't sell animal, any products that come from animals on social media these days. So a lot of my farm friends are running into um, being blocked, being, having their accounts deactivated. We need to make sure that we're safeguarding our businesses, regardless of what you sell um, and making sure that we're using social media to drive people off social media onto platforms that we own. When COVID hit and suddenly farmers markets were closing, I had a unique ability to still contact my customers and do so in a way markets closed markets closed with a day's notice. I was able to immediately send an email and say, Hey, this is how we're pivoting. We're going to be popping up in the back of our delivery truck on the road, right next to the market. And you order online and we'll be slinging meat out the back of the truck. Like we were still at the market, even though the market was closed, we were just on the side of the road and we were able to pivot that. And if I had just uploaded that to social media, There's a lot of people who would have missed that messaging because the conversion rate, like we have a huge opening rate when we send an email versus the algorithms, you know, granting us the ability to be seen on Instagram and Facebook. So I'm, I'm a big, big, big driver of use social media. Absolutely. But use it to get people onto the real estate that you own, which is your website, your e-commerce store and your email newsletter. And no matter what happens, if you've got an email list, that is something that you own and control. If a farmer's market goes out of business and they just stop operating for whatever reason, you still have a list of customers and access to be able to contact them at your disposal. If we run into, hopefully we never run into a problem like we've run into with the pandemic, but if we do, you know that you have access. You could open an online store. You could open a phone line. You can say, hey, call me an order and I'll meet you on the side of the road. That's literally what we did. We took online orders and we have a big yellow, we call it the big banana. We have a big banana truck that's like totally terrible looking and it's just a farm (laughs) truck. But we went and we set up on the side of the road and people could pick up their pre-orders. I'm not going to lie. The police were called on us every single week. But (laughs) when the cops came, they realized that we weren't selling, we were distributing. So it it fell Mm. out of that rule. So people were like, there's this girl selling stuff out of the back of a truck and they'd call <laughs> the cops would come down. They'd be like, Oh, it's just you again. <laughs> you think they get the banana yellow truck would just be the giveaway. Um, but we were able to move product and they realized that we were doing so in a very safe manner. Our customers were masked. They were social distanced. We were wiping everything down and we were distributing food. It's an essential service. Um, and it's an essential product. So we were able to, we never got in trouble for it, but we would have never had that ability had it not been for the fact that we were able to target our farmer's market called me and was like, can you please send out a notice? Because I'm worried people are going to, are going to show up when we're closed. Like we had built such a strong email list that even our market was relying on us to, to be the one to share the news. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That's awesome. Um, well, you have so much to offer. One, I've, we have to wrap this up soon, but um, because we're talking about social media, I know that um, with your marketing for farmers services, one of the things that you offer is an Instagram audit. And this is something that we have joked about in the past. And, you know, some people's social media is just so 
egregious. It's just like, burn it down, <laughs> like start it over. <laughs> um, it. So I was just curious, um, and because you do have such a strong voice on social media, you're really funny, you're really approachable, you just have like, obviously it's just you know, your personality is there, but when you're doing the Instagram audit, what are some of the things that you, you would, you know, highlight or say like, get rid of this, or these are things that you should not do? Um, what are some things that our listeners can kind of do a self audit, maybe look at their own sure. social media and, and what could they improve? <laughs> The number one thing that I see with farmers is when I go over, it's not clear in your bio if I can be a customer of yours. Do not make me dig on where you sell. (laughs) Like I should very easily be able to determine that you are selling in Vancouver or San Diego or where are you so I can decide. I want to know immediately. If I have to click a link to figure out if I can buy from you, you've lost me. Like you've just, I don't care how awesome your pictures are. I want to know immediately if I can support you and if you can actually be somebody that I can buy from versus just enjoy watching your photos and looking at your videos. So that's number one. Number two in your bio, please don't make your bio just about you. You're important and you need to show up, but I also want to know what's in it for me. In order for me to decide whether or not I'm going to follow, and this goes for customers, this goes for followers in general, this isn't just my rule, but when people go on, naturally, we want to know what's in it for us. And typically, farmers and food producers, we don't tend to be known for our exquisite photography. (laughs) We don't tend to have the most beautiful feeds, which is fine because we're seeing a big adjustment and we're seeing a big change back to more authentic people showing up more authentically. We don't need everything to be crisp, white, and beautiful. We're farmers. We just need to be true and authentic and show up with our faces. I mean, we need to make sure our photos are like clear and not fuzzy, like wipe the dirt, wipe the dirt off your lens before you take the photo for sure. But ultimately we need to be able to very quickly tell people what they're going to get from following us. And A, that they can actually support us because they're in an area where they can buy from us. And then just making sure that we we take the time to show up with our faces instead of just constantly. I mean, an animal picture is great and, you know, vegetable pictures are great, but I want to see the people behind the farm. That's how we get that no like, and trust factor. That's how we get the connection so that we can convert people from visitors to followers and then equally or more importantly to purchasers. Yeah, I got to get them to the purchase and oftentimes <laughs> you won't get them to the purchase unless they feel like they can trust you, especially in agriculture. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Those are great tips. So at Marketing for Farmers, you do a boot camp. That's kind of for people just getting rolling, right? Selling their things, yeah. um, individual coaching, the Instagram audits. And then you're doing a lot of public speaking um, on yeah. the you know, when you can get over borders and things to get to conferences. (laughs) So there's that. I I love doing, like, that's my favorite part of this. And when I launched Marketing for Farmers, it was in the middle of COVID. We were not closing at that time. I was just like, hey, I'm getting asked a ton. I'm just going to make this free Instagram account and people can come and get information because then I don't have to answer the same question to every farmer who reaches out. It was just an easy way to broadcast that information. Then I thought we were closing and I was like, Oh, I better monetize. I better like, I'm going to be a coach or a consultant and I'm going to, you know, sell some services at a reasonable price for agriculture, because this is my, this is my industry and this is the industry I love, but I need to come up with something different so that I'm not just relying on my farming revenue because that was dropped. Right. Fast forward. Now I'm doing all the things, but uh, I love it. It's it's a good combination for me of being able to still be in agriculture at a lower level than we were. And then that gives me time to be able to balance uh, my one-on-one coaching. And we do online workshops and all sorts of great resources at different price points and a ton of free content. I'm yeah. a big uh, advocate you, for free content. You are the... Mm-hmm. The most amazing person on social media for, I've watched some of your stuff, or I'll watch a reel, or you'll give a tip, and I'll say, okay, but I don't understand this one part about how to get started, and I've had you DM me and say, oh, look, here's I'm going to draw a circle here around this little spot that you need to look at on your Instagram so that you can keep going. So I guess kind of to wrap up, um, you've got a lot going on, and you're clearly you know, Energizer Bunny kind of personality. <laughs> so, so, so you're keeping up with a lot, I'm sure. But how, how much time are you spending on your online businesses versus speaking and farming and so long term um do you expect to be the online farm business guru big time or will you be doing that kind of as a sideline and still is the farm still calling do you still have chicks peeping in the garage (laughs) the farm is still calling the farm is the thing that gives me the balance and the and the 
brings it down to the real roots. And I don't, I don't think I could ever sell the services for boot camps and things like that without having a strong agricultural foundation. I have been to so many workshops that are run by people who aren't necessarily in agriculture. And when it comes to trying to grow a business online, when you're in farming, we're just, it's just a different beast. And so being able to make sure that I'm being authentic in the fact that I am actually am a farmer, I'm a farmer first, and I'm an online business consultant second. Um, providing free resources, paid resources, that's a secondary thing for me. Agriculture will be the first. I do have a benefit that I've got. Now we've got a lot more hours in our day because we're not doing farmer's markets. But aside from that, I've, I've got a wonder, this has turned into a family business. So my husband's out there now. My kids that started as young are now 13 and 16, my stepkids. So I mean, they needed jobs. And so now they're they're employees of the farm. They clock in, they clock out, they get a paycheck um, just like any other employee would. So we luck out in the fact that now I don't have to drive a kid to work somewhere else. They can just go out and work. So we definitely, I have a lot more support now on the farm than I did, which gives me an opportunity to do, I mean, the, the online educating portion of it, it like lights, it lights my heart on fire. I love working with other farmers. I love watching their businesses grow and seeing them make small shifts that make big impacts and just like the first time one of my clients posts a reel, it's just like it, it's <laughs> such a good moment when I see them showing up and their faces online and they're talking into camera and they're doing the things that they swore they would never do. Oh, so that's clients. just they such grow a up so fast. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm like they start with baby steps and then they're running, and it's just like it's it's fantastic. It's I love it. Yeah, it's awesome to see people progress from from what you do. So uh, we're gonna stay tuned. We're gonna see if mom yeah. and auntie and the kids talk you back into farmers markets at some point. <laughs> And uh, any any hints, any any scoop on what's next for uh, you and marketing for farmers? Yeah, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to launch a membership site. I think oh, we're cool. going to do a membership where you can get a really low price point for group coaching to try and keep um, this as being accessible no matter what stage of your business you're in. And I think we're going to do a deep dive topic every month where you're going to get free resources from me. You're going to get some paid coaching, but at a really good price point, um, just so that if you're in a position that it feels like you can't invest, because I, I know I'm a first generation farmer, I had to invest in literally everything to start. Um, it'll be a nice transition piece to, to give you the tools that you need. And if that's still outside of a price point, please do just come and check out my site. I have blog posts. We do live Q and A sessions every Saturday at 10 o'clock Pacific standard time over on Instagram. I answer your direct questions, no charge coaching 30 minutes every single Saturday. So there's a lot of free resources available for you over on my site. Um, the goal behind this was never to originally turn it into a business. It was just to help farmers. So right. I'm going to keep doing that in whatever capacity I can. Great. We'll keep so watching awesome. you and, uh, Hopefully the travel gods will be kind to us and maybe we'll see you in San Diego next March. I, w I would love that. Thank Thanks you so much for having me. Kendall. Thanks, yeah, Kendall. Thanks, Kendall. Bye. 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 Enjoy the rest of your quarantine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like heaven. <laughs> thanks for listening today. And big thanks to Vendor 101 for supporting new farmers and vendors, saving market managers time, and helping farmers markets thrive. And for their support of Temp Talk, the Farmers Market Podcast. Find more information by clicking the Vendor 101 logo on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Farmers Markets are all about community, and all of us, operators, farmers, and vendors, keep learning. Connect with people just like you from various parts of the country and share what's happening in your area in the terrific conversations over in our private Facebook group, the Farmers Market Pros Community. Please find us there, answer the three qualifying questions, and join the group. You can also message us on Instagram at Farmers Market Pros or email us at connect at farmersmarketpros.com. Thanks for listening to Tent Talk. Please leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you access your podcast and tell us and others how you're enjoying Tent Talk. If you are listening on YouTube, give us that thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next episode. Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market podcast, is proudly produced by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine Marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Thank you so much for listening today, and we will have another great episode next week, so tune in.